<laughs> okay, well, so we're in this series of messages on uh, Nehemiah. And you know, to tell you the truth, as an old negative guy, uh, I'm loving Nehemiah. Because stuff's getting done, things are happening, but it's so honest and real because there's all kinds of uh, agitation and stuff going on. It just reminds me of all my years as a pastor in churches right. that, uh, you know, there's always sort of this undertow going on and intrigue. And yet, God's work just keeps going, you know, in spite of it all. Um, so today, I was, um, I'm supposed to look at Nehemiah 5, uh, Chris uh, brought us through four uh, last week. Um, talking about the uh, threats from without and all those things. And so I thought of a clever title for uh, that were put down um, without. Hang on, hang on. What, what hang was on. it? It was really clever. Okay, I'm, I'm here. Here we go. Brown current. Without problems within. <laughs> what? That's what this is going to be about. Okay, turn off. <laughs> they don't deserve that. <laughs> okay. This is a new book. There's, there's a, in our life, when you think about it, how, how do we experience uh, problems and uh, undertow, you know, in our lives and the different things? It, it's not all the same. And so chapter four talks about the, uh, the problems, the threats that come from outside, right? The, uh, the, um, the, they don't really have anything to do with our personal life and things like that, but they're still really uh, significant and, and sometimes frightening. So, um, but then chapter five deals with the opposite of that, which is once the issues in, from without are dealt with, are we fine? Is everything great now? Anybody ever go through something and it, and it became really great for, from then on? <laughs> I never had that. I get going, what if I just get through this? If I just get through this, then, then it's gonna be. And then you know what happens? That as soon as you get through it, Something else shows up. That's right. <laughs> and, and usually, if it's not a threat from outside, then all of a sudden we got to deal with our stuff that we haven't had to deal with because we've been so focused on what might happen out there, right? And, and, and we get this wonderful picture of it in Nehemiah 4 and 5. Now, um, problems on the outside don't just happen, okay? So I want us to look a little bit here because... Um, we see a little progression. Remember Sam Ballot, the guy who's kind of uh, behind all the opposition? Um, he doesn't just wake up one day and be against them. We get to see a little uh, progression. So, for example, in chapter 2, when uh, he hears about Nehemiah coming with the uh, king's forest and power and authority and soldiers and everything, and they're going to rebuild the wall, it says in, in verse 10 that he was, that he was very frustrated. Isn't that funny? He wasn't mad. He was just frustrated. He was disturbed, one translation says. He was just disturbed by this. It bothered him. That's not even worth thinking about, is it? You've been frustrated. You've been disturbed. Things happen. And so, but then, uh, in uh, chapter 2, later on in chapter 2, verse 19, it says that um, his frustration and disturbing grew uh, and, and he started then to act and he started to mock Nehemiah. Who does he think he is coming in here and blah, 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 blah. And uh, ridiculing him. It was, it was a very personal attacks on Nehemiah. And, uh, and even accusing him by uh, innuendo that he is going to try and overthrow the king. Now he doesn't say that. He just asks a little question. Do you think he's going to try and overthrow the king? See, he's not accusing. He's just raising a question, you know, out of his frustration. You know, that's happened so much in churches. I can't believe, you know, how often no, no accusations are made. But boy, that real subtle, you know, do you think that maybe I don't know? I don't know. I know that it does. That. That's what I'm saying. It happens just before we get fired. You know, I, I'm not. I'm just saying. I'm just asking, really. You know. <laughs> yeah. People are so 
saying. I know. I, I remember one time I, there was a, a, some people were, were doing that with me, and, they, and they, I shouldn't say this because we're, we're on the video thing, but you know, hey. So, um, can we talk? Yeah. yeah. So, so someone had, had, had gone around and said, do you think it's right for the senior pastor to threaten to murder people in the church? <laughs> I mean, it's just a survey, right? <laughs> and people would go, no, I don't think that's right. Now, was the senior pastor threatening to murder people? Who knows, you know. But, but it, was, it was like, it was just an innuendo. It was just a seed planted. And, and so that's what Sam Ballot did here with Nehemiah, which is so great. You think it's right that he comes in here and he might try and overthrow the king? Is that okay? No. Oh. So... Then um, we see that uh, he gets really angry. And for the first time, he gets angry, and and he becomes incensed. The Bible says, and so it's grown. See, from just a frustration uh, to now he's incensed, and uh, and he moves from mocking Nehemiah and trying to undermine Nehemiah to now he's mocking the community. He's, he's mocking the people of God and saying, you know. First of all, they're crazy, and then they don't know how to build, and this whole thing's falling down, and blah, blah, blah. Then, in uh, chapter 4 and 11, his anger and rage gets so big that he starts rumors of terrorist attacks. Isn't that timely? <laughs> and he doesn't actually say what's going to happen, but he starts the rumors out there, they won't see us coming. We'll be there in the midst of them. And everywhere, before they even turn around, they'll be dead. We're going to sneak in there unseen, and they're going to be all killed. And this is all going to be stopped. And no one will know when it happens. It could happen at any time, at any place. And that one worked. People became worried. If we don't see it coming, if we never know what's going to happen, how can this be? What are we? What if we're just uh, sitting down for dinner on Memorial Day weekend, and all of a sudden the turkey blows up or whatever? I don't have turkey on Memorial Day. So, okay, well that's not going to happen. Okay, we know that. The burgers tonight, though. <laughs> but but it suddenly becomes this threat: unseen killers in the midst, right? And uh, they're going to attack wherever we turn. And so the people got onto this, and then they started round and round and round agitating about that. And, it was, and so that's how the outside attack grew, right? It, it expanded and, and became more intense. Now, how does Nehemiah deal with it? Because this is so important for us, because there's going to be times in your life when you're going to feel like you're getting slings and arrows from outside, right? Maybe you are there now. How do you respond to it? You know, it's interesting. Nehemiah never got angry at this. Isn't that weird? He just prayed. He'd hear what's going on. He'd hear the insults. He'd hear the insults. And he'd go, well, Lord, you know what to do. They belong to you. You know, why don't you deal with them? Take them. Now change them or take them home, Lord. That's been my prayer many times as a pastor. Change them or take them home. <laughs> Either one. But uh, so he basically turns them over to God. This is not my problem. This is your problem, God. It's your problem to protect, to help us do this work. We're here to serve you. Handle it. Isn't that amazing that he does that? But he does something else. And that is he calls the people together. And he tells them what's happening. He, that's why in this book, about the only names you ever hear are Sam Ballot and his buddies, right? When we talk about that, the, the offenders are the only ones who give a name. So, so Nehemiah identifies them. Says, this is what everybody's saying. This is what they're saying. This is how it's progressed. What are we going to do about it? Well, let's have some people on guard while others are working. We'll take turns. Then you feel so you don't have to be afraid. And he says, do not be afraid. We have work to do. We'll take precaution. Then we'll move on. And then I love that it says uh, in, in chapter 4, when Sanballat heard that the plot had been exposed, God frustrated his plans. Just shining the light 
on the problem diffuses it. Now, the, the Bible's always taught us that there's power in names, right? Um, Jesus called people by names intentionally. Sometimes he changed their name to give them different meaning. When kids were born, their names had significance, you know? And uh, you were probably given nicknames when you were kids, right? I'm not going to tell you what mine were. <laughs> um, but um, we all had them for good or bad evil. <laughs> but um, when we name the problem, it loses its power. That is so important. The fact that Nehemiah didn't do this in secret, but he said, let's all get together. Here's what we're dealing with. Here's who we're dealing with. Here's what the threat is. Here's what you're all hearing and saying. It's no secret. The problem was diffused. That's so important for us to realize. We don't have to be afraid to, to name it. Uh, in, our, in our physical health, sometimes I think, I don't want a diagnosis. But actually, I do. Because if we can identify, or somebody, maybe a doctor, can identify what's wrong, then we can look at alternatives and see what we can do to go forward. If everybody says, I don't know what's wrong, well, how are we ever going to address it, right? So we don't have to be afraid. We can, we can name the problems together, openly, and we can talk about them and we can say, Lord, we turn it over to you. How do we, how do we move forward from here? And, uh, and there's very, very strong power in that. Now, that's how we deal with, with uh, problems and threats from the outside. How do we deal with the threats from within? It's a little bit different. So chapter 5, let me read a little bit. They're talking about all the things they did in response to the outside problems. The chapter 5 starts. Now, the men and their wives, that's real important. It sounds sexist, but it's really important. The men and their wives raised a great outcry against uh, their Jewish brothers. Some were saying, we and our sons and daughters are numerous. In order for us to eat and stay alive, we have to get grain. Others were saying, we're mortgaging our fields, our vineyards, our homes, just to get grain during this famine. Others are saying, we have to borrow money to pay the king's tax on our fields and vineyards. Although, we're the same flesh and blood as our countrymen. And though our sons are as good as theirs, yet we have to subject our sons and daughters to slavery. Some of our daughters have already been enslaved. And we're powerless because our fields and our vineyards belong to others. <coughs> Think about this. The people from Jerusalem had gone into exile, had been carried away by foreign powers, uh, turned into slaves for years, and lived away. While they were gone, the remaining neighbors divided up their land, divided up their homes, divided up their property, moved on, and now the returning exiles come back and find somebody else is in their home, someone else owns their farm, somebody else is living where they were living and doing what they were doing, and now they're basically reduced to migrant work. We can't, we can't feed our families. Because on top of this, just coincidentally, I guess there's a famine going on. So as migrant workers, we're not getting enough to keep our children alive. And so we're selling them into slavery just to try and give them a place to live, food to eat. And it doesn't seem fair because it's our own families and friends and neighbors who are doing this to us. So now we have a problem from within. Our own families abusing us. Which is where a lot of abuse usually happens, right? In our own families. Feel like we're the same. We're, why are we being treated differently? We have no say in this. It doesn't seem fair, right? Now, it's interesting that... Um, this is the first time that Nehemiah gets angry. Isn't that weird? All the other stuff, all the other threats didn't bother him. Don't be afraid, we're going to handle it, blah, 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 blah. When he hears that there's problems within, 
people take advantage of each other, it's not fair. Then uh, it says verse 6, when I heard their outcry and these charges, I was very angry. Now, instead of just lashing out, though, he, he does the next best thing, which is he starts thinking about it, which is pretty cool, actually. So he didn't act in anger, but he was angry, and so he says, I pondered them in my mind. Then, here comes the plan. He does the same thing that he did with the threat from outside. Right? Remember how he called all the people together and he brought it out in the open? Said, Let's deal with this. This is our problem, right? Now he does the same thing. He thinks about it and he goes to the nobles and the officials, people who have some authority, and he said, you're exacting usury from your own countrymen. You're like loan sharks, you know? And uh, holding them hostage in their own way. You're, uh, I called together a large meeting to deal with them. And I said, as far as possible, we brought back our Jewish brothers and sisters who were sold to the Gentiles. Now you're selling your brothers and sisters only uh, for them to be sold right back to us. They kept quiet because they had nothing to say. So I continued. <laughs> Darn right. <laughs> Born preacher. Uh, what you're doing is not right. Shouldn't we walk in the fear of the Lord to avoid the reproach of our Gentile enemies? I and my brothers and my men are also lending the people money and grain, but let the exacting of usury stop. No loan sharking. Give back to them immediately their fields, their vineyards, their olive groves, their houses, all the things that have been taken while they were in exile. Give it back to them. and also stop the usury that you're charging them. How did the people respond, the officials, the nobles, how did they respond? Who were you to come in? No, they responded, we'll give it back. You're right, we'll give it back. And we'll not demand anything more from them. We'll do just as you say. Now, Nehemiah is a practical person. See, in, uh, we're a, a, a reformed church, reformed tradition, you've heard that word. Uh, I've always loved the Reformed tradition because it, it goes back to John Calvin, right? And John Calvin was this uh, French Catholic attorney who went to Geneva and started preaching morning and evening every day. And, uh, and he wrote the book, uh, The Institutes of the Christian Religion, which is everything you want to know about being a Christian but we're afraid to ask. <laughs> which is filled with many early century uh, swear words, actually. <laughs> so, you know, you can't actually quote it in a sermon. But, uh, but one of the things that he believed that kind of anchored his view of what it is to be a Christian is that no one can be trusted. Isn't that interesting? We're not good people getting better. Wouldn't it be nice if we were? But he said, no, actually, we're all scoundrels. That's what we have in common. We all need the Lord. And it doesn't matter if you're a little bit of a scoundrel and pretty good the rest of the way, or if you're a lot of scoundrel and just a little bit good. It doesn't really matter because down at the bottom, we, we can't really be trusted. And it's, it's interesting that the, the United States government was based and formed on John Calvin's theology. That's why we, when we give a different word, instead of saying the total depravity of humanity, we say checks and balances, right? Because we can't be trusted. See, that's important to know. Um, so anyway, Nehemiah, if he would have known, he would have been a pretty good reformed Calvinist there, you know, because after the people said, okay, we'll do just what you said, we'll give everything back, we're going to stop uh, loan sharking, we're going to do all the right things, just as you said, what does he do? So he shakes their hands and leaves them, happy that they've done the right thing. <laughs> oh, oh, no, no, that's not what it says. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. Then I summoned the priests and I made the nobles and the officials take an oath publicly to do what they promised. See, it's not enough to just get agreement because the Bible tells us through and through, you can't really trust people. You can love them, you can love them, just don't trust them. 
And so as soon as the nobles and everybody agrees, he goes, great, let's bring in some witnesses here and you all make a sacred vow publicly in front of everyone that this is going to happen. We don't want some deal done in a back room here. This is all out in the open. What can we learn from this? Well, um, I will confess, but I may have been wrong in my entire ministry. I was, I was thinking about it this week. Because I've said in my uh, ministry, I've made this vow, you know, no one will ever know how you vote from the pulpit. You know, they listen to your sermons day and night. They'll never know how you vote, blah, blah, blah. You're not going to do politics. We don't do politics in the church, you know. And we've talked about that. Because it divides. I, you know, I've been pretty consistent, haven't I? Right? What if I'm wrong? <laughs> this is one time, Joe. This is one time. This is one time I'm right. Okay. <laughs> See, I, I, I studied a business management at San Diego State. I was going to go to college, but I went to San Diego State. You know, so, okay. so we have, oh, oh, sorry. It's a small world after all. <laughs> so anyway, so I'm at San Diego State studying business, and we learned uh, macroeconomics, right? And then if that wasn't enough, the next year we learned microeconomics. And then we started reading the newspaper and we learned trickle-down economics. And then we learned voodoo economics. I mean, wait, there's a lot of economics out there. You know one thing I never learned in the business school at San Diego State? Spiritual economics. Never learned that. Never even thought about it. I don't think anybody did. Because why? We have our spiritual lives. We have our prayer life. We have our relationship with God. And then we have our political opinions, and we have our economic theory, and we have our world over here. But, but really, we're over here being more spiritual. This is the spiritual side of the church, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> people, I don't know. So, and, 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 uh, and we, set, we found a way to separate what goes around in our communities from what we believe and, and what our devotion is and what we think God wants to have happen in us. And we ignore passages like where Jesus says, if somebody comes to you and they're hungry, don't say, I'll pray for you. Give them something to eat. Don't say, I'll pray for you and walk away. Now, wait, but if I pray for them, that's kind of a you know spiritual world. That's good. And prayer's good. I'm not opposed to prayer. Right? If I get involved and try and help them, that's kind of a political act. The interesting thing here in this passage of Nehemiah, the only time Nehemiah gets really angry is when he sees injustice in the community. That's what he got down. This isn't right. What you're doing isn't right. You're treating your brothers and sisters unfairly. This is not what God wants in this family. And I think he got mad because he realized it doesn't matter how high we build the wall and how well we build the wall and how hard we work and how protected we are by God as we rebuild our city and our self-esteem and all those things if we're cannibalizing each other underneath the surface. It doesn't matter. I thought that was kind of a strong word, but then I realized in Philippians, Paul says, why are you people in the church cannibalizing each other? Why are you tearing off limbs and eating them from each other? What's wrong with you? Why are you devouring one another? Maybe that's spiritual economics. Help the people who have been mistreated. Help the people who are in need. Someone's hungry, feed them. But I'm not going to say that today because I don't believe in talking about politics and economics and stuff, so I'm going to not say that. I'm just going to leave that unsaid. <laughs> but, wait a minute. Okay, somebody else can say it. I can quote someone, can I? Yeah. <laughs> Tony Evans at Dallas, he had a nonprofit called the Urban Alternatives. This is what he said. The people could not have true justice on a human level until they got right with God on a vertical level. 
As long as they were not right with God, they could not enjoy the good news. You cannot have social justice until the people in society get right with God. Everybody wants a better society, but nobody wants to bow before God in his moral code. But seeking, uh -oh, but you can't have one without the other. So our society is wasting its time seeking justice without God because things will continue to deteriorate in proportion to the rate at which God is dismissed from our culture. The Bible is absolutely clear that when society marginalizes God, then God allows and even causes the society to experience revolution. It begins to self-destruct. There is no spiritual economics and spiritual life. It's one. And the closer we get to God, the more we realize he has a, a, a part for us to play in caring for, in ministering justice, and getting mad at injustice, and, and like Nehemiah, and calling it out in the open. Name the problem. Let's do something. The funny thing is, when the threat was from the outside, what did he do? He prayed about it. <clears throat> Turned it over to the Lord. When the problem was injustice in the society and unfair treatment of people economically, he didn't go off to the closet and pray about it. He marched right in and said, this has to change. We're not going forward with this. What do we get mad about? Is there anything that we get mad about? That we say, this has to stop me. It's time to stop this. You know, remind me of uh, Deuteronomy. Way back. When you've eaten and are satisfied, praise the Lord God for the good land he's given you. Be careful that you do not forget the Lord your God, failing to observe his uh, commands, his laws, his decrees that I'm giving you today. Otherwise, when you eat and are satisfied, when you build fine homes and settle down, and when your herds and flocks grow large and your silver and gold increase and all you have is multiplied, then your heart will become proud. And you'll forget the Lord, your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of slavery, who led you through the vast and dreadful desert, thirsty, waterless land with venomous snakes and scorpions. He brought you water out of a hard rock. He gave you manna to eat in the desert, something your fathers had never known, to humble and to test you so that in the end it might go well with you. You might say to yourself, my power and the strength of my hands have produced the wealth for me. But remember the Lord your God, for it's he who gives you the ability to produce the wealth. And so confirms his covenant, which he swore to your forefathers. I think Nehemiah was mad because he thought, we're going to get this wall built, and everybody's going to say, hey, didn't we build a good wall? Don't we feel fine now? Aren't we respected among the world? while we cannibalize one another with it. There's no place in God's spiritual economy for pride and look what I've done. Because even when we're blessed, which we are, and we prosper, which we do, even then, it's thank you, Jesus. Because it all belongs to him anyway. So maybe today you're feeling threatened from threats on the outside. That's fair. Maybe today you're feeling mistreated on the inside. That's fair too. Let's name it without fear. <clears throat> and 
us say, Lord, have your way in me. Have your way in us. Have your way in this. We may not trust each other, but we surely can trust God. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, for your word, we thank you for your grace. We are more grateful than we ever could be. Lord, thank you that you've uh, not left us to figure things out, but you lead us step by step, just like we saw in saying today. And you're a great God. Give us the courage to trust you and to look around our community and treat people with the love and respect that, that you show. Help us not to fall into the temptation to cannibalize or just feel proud and aloof. We all need you. And you love us all. So we claim your grace in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.